Okay, 700, this is my response to you. And for those of you that want to pass this by and go on to another video, if you don't really care for discussions about religion or anything like that, um, won't bother me a bit. And I'm nowhere going to make this video 92 minutes like his. Now, he can keep my interest for 92 minutes, but I dare say I can't keep anybody's interest for more than about 10 minutes, including my own. So what I did was I actually made about 10 to 12 different topics that I'm going to try to touch on if I can make this video short enough. I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping to do it in one shot and not have to do it over again because I don't want it to run long, but I'll at least touch on about 10 to 12 points and two points that I think we pretty much are in agreement about too, which starting out, the first point I'm going to bring up is at 27 minutes. Um, also, just before I get started, uh, I'll put the link down below for anybody that wants to know what I'm referencing here because some of this may not make any sense to you unless you can reference the original video. If you did actually watch the original video by Seven Hunted, I'll put the link down below in the description. So at 27 minutes you asked the question, can you really be a true Christian if you never actually made the choice to become a Christian? Yes, I agree with, well, the, the question, the, the correct answer to that question is you can't become a Christian unless you actually make the decision for yourself to become a Christian. I don't believe belonging to a church, if your card is in some membership role, if you attend church regularly, if you know the Bible beginning to end, if you haven't made that decision for yourself to become a Christian and a follower of Christ, uh, you just you, you may call yourself a Christian by culture. I know a lot of people look at it as a cultural thing or like belonging to a club. I guess if that's all you call it, then to you, you would be a Christian. But to me, it has to be somebody that actually made a commitment. If the Christian God, this is at 28 minutes now, this is the point you made right after that, if the Christian God were introduced today, would it get as big? Um, these are kind of hard when you're talking about something like that that is never never was going to be that way. So it's really hard to answer that way. But the best thing I could tell you is if, if God was for it, if there really is a God, which I obviously believe, even though I was skeptical at one time, if there really is a God, the time introduction for when he would want to introduce himself to mankind in whatever way would be the best time possible. So yes, it would work in any way, shape, or form. Okay, uh, 30, 30 minutes, a related question, or related, st yeah, it's a related question. It can, uh, can it work today as a modern religion? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I think it's probably needed more today than any other time, well, or at least as much as any time in the past, because who would not rather, instead of being judged for everything you've ever done wrong in your life, would not rather receive mercy and forgiveness? I mean, just basically friendships, marriages, any kind of relationship with another person, I think to function as best as it can, you need to show a lot of mercy and a lot of forgiveness. And I think that's something that's really lacking nowadays. I mean, I'm not saying that Christians have the uh, only ones that have this kind of philosophy, that Christians are the only ones that have this type of philosophy. I know among a lot of other religions and a lot of other denominations that the philosophy is the same. I mean, would you rather actually... If, if you had to actually pay the price for everything you did wrong in your life, if every time you broke a law, you got arrested for it and got the full punishment, that'd be a pretty lousy life. I mean, I would rather much more get forgiveness myself than punishment for everything. And your statement at 30 minutes, I agree with too. Religion does give hope. I mean, just looking at it even before I was a believer as a skeptic, um, I kind of thought at the time before I became a believer at the age of 29 that there probably was, there was, there, I was kind of partially agnostic, but I believed if there probably was a God out there that kind of start, got the universe kick-started and did everything, he's probably not concerned with uh, anything in my life personally. And then later on I found out that God really was. But yeah, the fact of when you die, that it's not just the end, does give you some hope, even if it's false hope. I mean, if you do have that hope, you at least think that there's some kind of a chance. And that's kind of the rub about the difference between an agnostic and an atheist versus a Christian. I mean, you guys will never, if you are, end up being right in the point, which I definitely do not think you are right, obviously, because I'm a Christian, otherwise I would, but let's just, you know, say for uh, uh, sake of argument that you guys are correct, you'll never get to be able to find out, whereas us as Christians, if we're correct, we will be, be able to find out, you know, the end result of what we believe, so... Um, kind of unfair in a way, but I guess that's just the way it would work out, you know, logically. Um, 36 minutes, you said lack of documentation of events in the Bible. That I would have to, along with the accuracy of the Bible, I would have to really counter that strongly. Even as a non-believer, if you look at the way 
that they treat historic documents. And, and let's also remember that the Bible is not a book. People look at it that way because we see it bound together in a work and we go, oh, here, this is this book. It's not actually. It's a whole bunch of different writings and different forms of writing. Some of it is Proverbs. Some of it is poetry. Some of it is prophecy of the future. Some of it is prophets speaking out for God. Some of it's history going back to the early Jewish religion. And some of it is actual letters sent out to the different churches. So it is many, many. It is over 60 different separate documents written by different people. And the reason why that you can tell it's accurate is because of the number of copies that exist. Like any kind of document, and this would go for any type of writing whatsoever. If a, if a writer back 2,000 years ago wrote a novel of 200 pages, obviously it would be very unlikely that that document would survive. So what you would have to do is you would have to track down copies. You would go to all the various places where the copies spread in different parts of the country and then see if they were all very, very similar. You could pretty much reproduce the way the original work was written. And any major changes of any one particular section would show up as being very different than all the rest of the different copies. So just using regular document forensics and tracing down the different copies of the different works of the Bible, I would say it holds out as being probably one of the most accurate documents. And I'm not talking at all about whether you believe that God is real or whether you believe in the miracles. I'm just talking about as a written work of history, I think the accuracy holds up very well. And even if you consider some translation mistakes which have been found from time to time and other things, there is nothing even in any of the copies that very slightly that change the basic message. Nothing about any of these, even if you accept that maybe some of these minor changes are the original and all the rest of the copies are wrong, it doesn't basically change the, the major point of each book or it does not change the major idea that God is trying to present to people. So. Um, I would definitely disagree with that about the lack of documentation of events of the Bible. I think they are pretty well documented as they take place. Now, you may say that, you know, well, that these people claim they wrote down that there was a miracle, but it wasn't really a miracle. Okay, but I say that it's accurate that that is what they wrote. Um, following rules of the Old Testament invading countries, etc. Well, the other thing about it with the, doc the doctrine of Christianity is there are... These are two separate ways that God dealt with his people. The first way in the Old Testament was dealing with the people through rules and regulations. And this was because of the way we wish to deal with God. It wasn't God's choice to do it that way. God's choice always was to show us mercy and to show us forgiveness. But we decided we could be good enough to reach God and we could follow enough rules and we could follow enough regulations. And if you read the Old Testament, constantly people are crying out to... to have God give them more things to do so that they could prove how much they loved God. And God himself even said, like in Hosea, you know, more than sacrifice, I desire mercy. God, God even in the Old Testament, is expressing that, you know, you guys are kind of going about it wrong, but nonetheless he let us do it the wrong way until we got tired of doing it the wrong way. And then the New Testament came with mercy and forgiveness, which showed us that it wasn't from us reaching out to God, it was God reaching out to us with his mercy and forgiveness. That's the only way the situation is going to work. It's not going to work. We'll never have enough rules that we can follow well enough to make it. it. It just doesn't work that way. Plus, you also get the thing, too, that even among Christians, if you have a denomination that's very legalistic and likes to follow rules, what people end up doing is they lord it over each other. Well, you know, I'm a little bit better Christian than this guy is sitting next to me because look at all these rules I follow better than he does. And you basically, you missed the point. You, did, you didn't even get the point. Um... Does the Bible endorse slavery or just show it how to deal with a difficult situation? We were talking about slavery in the Bible. Yes, this, the Bible does deal with a lot of things. The Bible deals with the Roman government. As a matter of fact, uh, during Jesus' time, the Roman government was in power, and there was a lot of unchristian things about the Roman government, and his apostles and disciples wanted him to overthrow the government, but Jesus, being as smart as he was, knew that that wasn't the purpose of him being there, and even if he did that, all they would be doing was just they would become the oppressors and the Romans would become the oppressed. So um, slavery was the same thing too. I mean, basically, if you were just if Jesus had come there just to orchestrate a slavery re revolt, then the slaves would probably take over and then make their masters the slaves. That wasn't the point. The point was to change people's hearts to where they didn't want to have to treat somebody as a lower person than the other person. In fact, there's a whole Bible book, uh, a whole Bible message about that in the book of Philemon, where Paul talks about 
a slave that had run away from his master, and he asked the master that was a friend of, that Paul obviously, by the way he's writing, you could tell he knew this guy, and he said, will you accept him back and account anything he did wrong to you on my account? And being a close friend of his, he knew that would carry some weight, and he said, accept him back as your brother. He didn't say accept him back as a slave, accept him back as your brother. If all of a sudden you look at the people that used to be your slaves or your servants as being equal to you in the eyes of God, then there's a possibility your heart's going to change. Until people's hearts change, they're not going to look at things any different. If you actually look at the history of slavery in this country, who was it that led the uh, Reformation and the uh, getting rid of slavery in the United States? It was a group of Christians, a group of Christians that really understood Scripture and didn't try to use it to, uh, they didn't decide, well, I want to keep slaves, so I'm going to try to find passages in the Bible to justify it. They looked at the Bible the way it was written, that all of us are the same in the eyes of God, so we can't say that somebody that looks different, acts different, or is indifferent in any other way is different than us. They're all children of God. Nobody should be a slave of anybody else, but you have to change people's hearts first. Okay, also, you talk about women as second class. If you look at Jesus' example, and he is always the supreme example on how to handle the situation and how to operate, if you look at his two uh, times that he came in contact with women. One was the woman that was going to set to be, was set to be stoned because she was an adulteress, and uh, Jesus went over and said, you know, he who's without sin cast the first stone, and then he sat down and then he uh, leaned down and started writing on the ground, and the people one by one dropped the rocks and, and went away. So he rescued a woman that was going to be condemned for adultery. We still don't know what happened to the guy if he, you know, if he ran away or whatever. They certainly weren't after the guy; they were after her. But uh, no, he, he didn't call her a condemned woman because she was caught doing what she did. He, he treated women respectfully, too. There was a woman by the well, and she was there in the middle of the day. Well, why would a woman be there in the middle of the day when it was hot? Well, that's because she couldn't associate with the other so-called virtuous women that were just married to one guy. And later on, Jesus told her about her life that, yeah, I realize who you're with right now isn't your husband. You've been married several times before, and the guy you're with right now isn't even your husband. So he didn't say, oh, you, you, know, you whore, you harlot, you slut. He just basically told her about her life and told her, you know, he treated her, talked with her, talked with her respectfully, and just asked her to maybe change her heart and change her mind about what she was doing and how she was operating in her life. Didn't condemn her, didn't yell at her, didn't scream at her, anything like that. So if you go by Jesus' example, women are absolutely equal to men in God's eyes. In fact, it says in the Bible, too, it's like when you get to heaven, there's going to be no difference. These cultural differences are man made. There isn't going to be male or female, there isn't going to be free or slave. In heaven, we're all going to be exactly equal. And if you look at many passages in the Bible, um, it says exactly that, that women are to be treated equally. Because if we're flawed human beings, do we do that always? No. Young Earth creation versus evolution. Um, as a, my, a matter of fact, my denomination has always uh, been pretty much, all during the modern era, has been in favor of science. If you go to any Catholic school, any Catholic university, all different theories of science are taught. Um, I agree with what my biology teacher said in high school. He said, basically, I know a lot of you people believe that the universe was created by a deity called God, but we're using the scientific method and teaching by scientific methods in this class means we don't have a way to cover that. The scientific method does not have that as, as an option. So until they invent some new method of proof that science can use, that's just not an area we can deal with. And he left it at that, and I was fine with that. Um, I'm also not any expert on anthropology or anything like that. I studied chemistry and biology, and I've also had a love of physics my whole life. I can kind of talk with some knowledge in those areas. Um, as far as anthropology and fossils and things like that, I have to leave it to other people to kind of explain to me and then interpret what they know. So I don't really want to speak at length about something that I know so little about. I could probably sound stupid really quickly. Different denominations you're talking about. Well, if there's God, how come all these churches are so different? Well, that's not a new thing. If you actually look in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches that were in the same basic area. They were in walking distance where a preacher could actually walk around, and that was actually a, where they first got the idea of circuit preachers. But in Revelations, there was seven churches, and all of those different churches, if you look at what God liked about what those churches were doing and disliked about what those churches were doing, they almost seem as different as Baptists, Catholics, Methodists, and anything like that. So this was still in the time of the apostles as the churches were forming in different regions. They all had their problems. This is just another thing that just happens to be because human beings form religions. Uh, God isn't so concerned with our religion or our denomination so much as he wants a relationship with us. 
and those are the two conflicting values. You know, people want to form religions, they want to form rules, and there are some important things that a religion or a denomination can accomplish, but if you take that as being equal to or above your personal relationship with God and knowing Him, you've kind of got it wrong, in my opinion. Religions are man-made, that is true. Relationship with God is no. Okay, that is uh, just basically what I was explaining here. Okay, the last point right here, I'm going to have to totally disagree on this last point. The burden of proof is on the believer to prove there is God. Um, I totally disagree with that. If, if it says what it says in the Bible, God is always wanting to reach out to us and make himself known and be being a skeptic too. That's what I kind of expected, and that's how I did end up becoming a believer because God ended up showing me enough to get past my skepticism. I'm not going to get into my testimony. I did that on another video a long, long time ago, and this is a... A discussion, so we're not going to get into, into that kind of thing. But um, the other thing too is, if there was somehow, some way, I could reach out to you and give you absolute proof that there is a deity up there, um, like I believe in, that's still not going to necessarily mean you're going to want to follow him or be a part of uh, any kind of denomination—Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever—that wishes to worship him. So even knowing that is no guarantee. I mean. If I believe in God, obviously as a Christian, I also believe in Satan, and Satan believes in God. He lived with him in heaven, but he's certainly not a follower of God, and he's not somebody that worships God anymore or really cares much about him. I mean, he's basically working the, you know, the opposite extreme of the, of the um, line of what God is trying to do. So just because you believe there is a God doesn't necessarily gain anything for you. So until actually God is reaching out, and it, and it says too, the, the funny thing about it is, I'm a person that I wish I could really believe in total free will, but it seems like the Bible has a bit of determinism in, in it too. And I know a lot of my atheist and agnostic friends are strong determinists. And uh, it kind of the Bible does have a lot of evidence for that too, that it's actually first God that reach out, reaches out to us. We think we're the ones that, that accepted God, but actually God reached out to us first and accepted us. It's, it's still hard for me to believe because I don't like to think we're some kind of robots or something like that. Um, that's another point, too, about people say, well, why does God allow evil? Well, you could actually make sure that evil doesn't happen. You could control people enough that you can constrain them to only do what you want them to do. But that's kind of what we do with prisoners in maximum, you know, maximum prisons, you know, maximum security prisons. And that's not much of a life, really, being, you know, monitored every minute, being constrained. I mean, you're in bondage a lot of times. You have cuffs and leg irons on, so... Yeah, God could make it, but, you know, what kind of a life would that be? Would you really want to live a life like that when you were so bound and constrained that you couldn't possibly do anything by your own free will? You just had to do what somebody else exactly wanted you to do. So, you know, if, if you do want people to have the freedom to have a relationship with you, you also have to have them, give them the freedom to not have a relationship with you and also do whatever they feel like doing. And that does oftentimes make for a very sad situation here on Earth. Well, I hope I didn't drone on for too much and bore a lot of people in uh Hope this at least gave you an answer to a few of your main points. I do really appreciate it. Let me just say this, that you know I, I could not even imagine somebody bothering to make a 92-minute video to um, do a response to me. And uh, you also included Jesus Freak in, too, if he wants to jump in and put some of his thoughts in with that, too. But um, that's very appreciated. And I never, ever consider the fact of what a person's belief system is when I consider them a friend. That has nothing to do with it. You... Basically, if you want to be a friend to me and you want to treat me like a friend, I'll treat you like a friend. The, the belief system you go by doesn't really have a lot to do with it, really. I mean, there can be some people that basically have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and if they're really annoying and hard to be around, I, I don't really want to be around them. And if uh, an uh, a atheist or an agnostic is a kind person and uh, a, a, a very you know, nice-acting person and wants to be friends with me, I want to be friends with them, too. It's just, you know, natural. So anyway, take care, everybody. Talk to you later.